My name is Ruggero Maria Santilli. I would like to thank all distinguished speakers, all participants and all organizers of this important uh, conference. In my lecture, I would like to present certain historical aspects underlying the famous argument by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, according to which, quote, quantum mechanics is not a complete theory, end of quote. I believe that um, a knowledge of the historical background is important to have an in-depth knowledge of the famous EPR argument. So let's begin our lecture. Let's go back to Germany in 1935, in which, as we all unfortunately know, the Nazi had reached the peak of their military as well as political power. But what a number of scholars do not emphasize sufficiently well is that the Nazi had reached the peak of their scientific power. The reason is that um, quantum mechanics is a theory that was conceived, structured, and developed by German scientists. Here we have on the left Max Planck, and then the middle Irving Schrödinger, the originator of the famous Schrödinger equation. And on the right, we have Werner Heisenberg, the originator of this famous um, time evolution with the Lie algebra structure. In 1935, three then unknown Jewish immigrants from Europe, Albert Einstein, Boris Podolsky, and Nathan Rosen, had the courage of opposing the Nazi in the peak of their scientific power by stating quantum mechanics is expected to need a completion, namely broadening, a generalization. The, um, this conference has been organized to honor the memory of, of Albert Einstein, Boris Podolsky, and Nathan Rosen for their courage that they showed in, in 1935, a time in which America had no military power as yet. Not now, of course. Thanks, God. Indeed, um, their paper is absolutely is inspiring, and I recommend it to, to all scholars, but not also to read it. The, um, the first statement is very well known and, and says, quote, quantum mechanics, and, I, and we are now quantum chemistry, pff, are not complete theories. And end of quote. What does it mean? It means that quantum mechanics, quantum chemistry are a magnificent theory. They work very well, very well in certain conditions, but not necessarily so for under broad, sufficiently broader condition. The second statement is very deep for quantum chemistry because it states that the, the wave function of Schrodinger equation cannot represent the entire physical and I add chemical reality. Indeed. It's very easy to see that the Schrodinger equation for the two identical electrons of a valence bot predict, predicts a repulsion with the ensuing lack of a quantitative representation of a molecular structure at this, mo at this moment in time of the, 20, the 21st century. The last statement is, um, is also extremely well known. Um, is by Albert Einstein, quote, God does not play dice with universe, end of quote. Einstein was attacked for this statement from all corners, even dubbed as a crackpot. The, um, but let's, be, let's, be, let's think about uh, with our own mind. There is no doubt that a proton in empty space verifies Heisenberg uncertainty um, principle. Qu period. This is experimentally verified. But let's think in different physical conditions, such as, as in illustrated in this picture, a proton in the core of a star. That proton, ladies and gentlemen, is exposed to extreme pressure from all possible directions. It is then very plausible to expect that the uncertainty of this proton in the core of a star have to be different than the uncertainty of the same proton when it's free to move in all directions in empty space. The EPR paper, was attacked from oh, the entire scientific community immediately following its appearance. Here, is, here we show the, one of the most vociferous opposition, that by Niels Bohr, the head of the Copenhagen, Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. I studied this paper when I was in, um, during my graduate studies at the University of Torino in Italy, but I was baffled because um, Niels Bohr does not address the point. The point is that um, Einstein does not state that quantum mechanics is wrong. No, he, can, he cannot state that. 
it just states, Einstein states that um, there may be condition under which uh, quantum mechanics is, is inapplicable and therefore, and therefore it needs a completion. Now, because of this virulent opposition to, to Einstein that lasted um, the rest of his life, that Niels Bohr was dubbed an, uh, to be an anti-Semitic. However, um, I don't think this dubbing applies to, to Niels Bohr because his wife was Jewish. Also, Niels, Niels Bohr helped uh, many Jewish physicists escape the Nazi and emigrate to the United States. So, so the issue which is on, on the table is why Niels Bohr was so adamant against Einstein. It is my opinion that, uh, that Niels Bohr acting that way because of the power of the Nazi of the time. After Niels Bohr, there were a flurry of other, so many I cannot quote them all here. I want to quote only a paper by, by J.S. Bell, who states that um, um, a set of, of quantum mechanical particles having spin one half does, cannot admit a classical counterpart. I, um, I did um, spend time to prove this, that this statement is correct. It's because none of the famous uh, Bell's the inequality, I proved that it is correct. But under the silent tacit assumption, which are for point particles in empty space, which is necessary for which assumption are necessary for the very formulation of the axiom of quantum mechanics in this, in this mathematical elaboration. And in fact, the moment we, we will see that the moment you consider different physical conditions such as extended particles within hyperdense physical medium, um, Bell's inequality cannot even be formulated, let alone, uh, let alone this probe. No, this, uh, it, it becomes inapplicable. And any statement that Bell's inequality is wrong will be unethical. In conclusion, as a result of the Nazi pressure, uh, the quantum mechanics was initially established worldwide. Then money came into the picture to reach the kernel situation in which the um, governmental um, agency throughout the world, they, um, they dispersed billion, if not trillions of dollars of public money, all based on the condition that, of very, that the research has to verify quantum mechanics, no matter what the conditions are considered throughout the, throughout the universe. Ladies and gentlemen, this conference has been organized to honor the memory of Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, and initiating what has been absent for a century, namely, initiate due scientific process on, uh, on, the, on, on the expected need that quantum mechanics, and therefore quantum chemistry, will need a suitable completion. In order to outline uh, the, the, the underlying research that lasted for uh, half a century, let me go back to the mid-1960s during my PhD uh, studies in theoretical physics at the, at the University of Torino that you can see here. As part of my PhD curriculum, um, I, I had to study the Pierre argument. And of course, I studied um, Niels Bohr uh, strong objection as well as the other objection. But all those objections did not convince me the, the, uh, the reason for my reservations uh, are depicted uh, here in this slide. Where, where, what do we see? Well, we see something that uh, has been seen by mankind since the dawn of civilization, the combustion of fossil fuel. Let's see it with, with a third millennium type of eye. What do we see? We see an irreversible process, namely a process whose time reversal image violates causality because it will imply that the smoke has to reconstruct the coal with the violation of a number of, of, of uh, physical law, let alone common sense. When exposed to this process, I was told that, uh, that uh, the irreversibility is in, in reality illusory because um, when irreversible processes such as this combustion are reduced to elementary constituents, then um, quantum mechanics is recovered in full. This view that was um, indicated to me back in, nine, in the mid 60s is still widely adopted nowadays in the physics uh, community. Uh, with all due respect to my teacher that I would like to honor to this day, uh, I, uh, nevertheless, I did not agree. 
and indeed I proved a number of so-called so no-reduction theorems. One of them states that the macroscopic irreversible system cannot be consistently decomposed into a finite number of elementary particles, all verifying quantum mechanics and related conservation laws, vice versa. A finite number of elementary particles um, verifying quantum mechanics cannot reconstruct a macroscopic irreversible system under the correspondence or any other principle. The origin of, um, of, the, of the, this theorem is essentially the, um, in, in, due to, uh, to the um, time reversibility of Heisenberg equation, Heisenberg time evolution, if you want, of an observable A, which is characterized by the, the, those brackets. The brackets are Lie bracket or Lie product, which as one can see is anti-symmetric between the, the, the observable A and the total energy, the Hamiltonian A. Technically, we'll say that <coughs> the Lie bracket are uh, invariant under anti-hermeticity and therefore can only represent the reversible system. In fact, the time um, evolution of the, uh, the of the Hamiltonian is identically null and cannot be otherwise. I spent years of my life in trying to represent irreversible system via quantum mechanics and failed. So therefore I reached a point in which I, um, I decided to dedicate the rest of my life to complete quantum mechanics and honor Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen. And that's, ex that's exactly what I've done since, an, uh, for, since my graduate studies. I initiated my study by going back to the founder of analytic mechanics, which is Giovanni Luigi Lagrange, who was born in Torino and, and, and wrote most of his paper in Italian that were thereafter translated in Latin or French or maybe other languages. In studying the original uh, um, paper written by Lagrange in Italian, I, I was shocked to see the rather substantial difference between the Lagrange equation that I was studying in at the graduate school, which are here depicted here on the top, and um, in the true Lagrange equation, which are down here. What are the differences? The equation on the top can only represent conservative system and um, with um, action at a distance, potential interactions that are well known to be reversal over time. But in reality, instead, the Lagrange introduced in his equation this, uh, this, um, this quantity, which he called an external term. And, um, and uh, for the representation of non-conservation as well as irreversibility. Hamilton from England, who, who followed uh, Lagrange, the, the, uh, the, uh, presented this equation also with external terms that you can see here, uh, here depicted in the, at the bottom of this slide. Again, uh, the entirety of the, the physics literature, or let's say the primary physical literature of, of the 20th century, only quotes uh, the Hamilton equation without external terms, and they are called, which, which equations are nowadays called truncated Lagrange equation. The, um, once identified the physical origin of the, of, uh, of the reversibility, then I, um, I decided to seek a, a completion of quantum mechanics based on the completion of the Lie algebra, because Lie algebra are, uh, are essentially the ultimate origin of the re reversibility of quantum mechanics. While if we, if we can enlarge then quantum mechanics into a form that is no longer invariant under anti-hermeticity and therefore allowing um, a, co a quantitative representation of irreversible process. I spent about a year of my life in mathematics library in Europe to look for such an algebra that, defined by mathematicians. And finally, I locate one that attracted my attention is in a new algebra which only defined by the American mathematician Albert without any realization. And he called them um, Lie admissible and Jordan admissible uh, algebra. Unfortunately, I cannot um, uh, review those algebra here for lack of time, but we will review them during the, the mathematical session. The once identified the correct definition with all the basic axioms, then I introduce um, a realization of those jointly Lie admissible and Jordan admissible algebra, and I publish my PhD thesis in the Il Nuovo Cimento, 
which is the official journal of the Italian Physical Society, in which, is, which paper is considered by a number of colleagues as the first paper signaling the completion of, um, of quantum mechanics according to Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, because the, 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 jointly with the, the completion of Lie algebra into this Lie, jointly Lie admissible and Jordan admissible algebra, I introduced specific realization that um, also of the, the of Eisenberg time evolution. While being at Harvard, in late 1978, I published at Springer Verlag two monographs under the title Foundation of Theoretical Mechanics, which had been written during my stay at MIT from 1974 to 1977. And I published following a seminar course, which I del delivered in the field at, uh, at the Lyman Laboratory of Physics. Volume one in the left identifies the ultimate limits of representational capability of Lagrange and Hamilton equation, and therefore of quantum mechanics. I achieved this objective by working out in all possible details, historical as well as technical, the so-called integrability conditions for the existence of a Lagrange, namely the necessary and sufficient condition for a given system to be represented by quantum mechanics. The, in the second volume, instead, then I presented a, um, a generalization, but in, the, in, in sign language, we also use the word covering of uh, quantum mechanics under the proposed name of hadronic mechanics that appear in the second volume for the first time. Jointly, in the second volume, I presented all the, the initial foundation of hadronic mechanics, which essentially can be reduced to this joint Lie admissible and Jordan admissible generalization of Eisenberg equation, essentially consisting of Eisenberg equation, but in which the, with the two new matrices of operator R and S, that um, they are sandwiching within the observable and, uh, and the Hamiltonian. And whenever the, the two operators R and S are different, then this equation describes the time evolution of the energy and not the conservation of the energy, therefore setting the foundation for a, an apparent representation of irreversible processes. During the report to the faculty that was kept in that time in the early every spring, I, um, I presented uh, to, my, um, to my colleagues, as, as well as to their graduate studies, the need to initiate the study of the inclusion in our um, mechanical formulation of Lagrange and Hamilton external terms, because they appear to be recommendable for, uh, for quantitative treatment of any energy releasing process, thus including uh, combustion of fossil fuel, but also the, uh, but also the controlled nuclear fusions. I presented my argument with this vignetta that in Italian means uh, sketch, um, handmade sketch, in which, as you can see, it depicts um, a, a, an executor that is chopping off Lagrange and Hamilton external terms, while below Lagrange and Hamilton says, no, no. Unfortunately, the, this proposal received no interest whatsoever that I can remember. I then presented a theorem of direct universality of the Lie admissible and Jordan admissible uh, completion or covering of Heisenberg equation in the sense that I admit as a particular case all possible completion of Heisenberg equation for non-conservative system characterized by an algebra in the bracket of the time evolution as com currently understood in mathematics namely an algebra defined over a numeric field with characteristic zero. In fact, Lie admissible uh, algebra include any known algebra uh, that, that we can mention, uh, Lie, Jordan, Lie isotopic, Jordan isotopic, nilpotent, flexible, etc. In order to make sure that my colleagues did not think that I was pursuing my personal dreams of generalizing quantum mechanics, while in reality I was uh, simply honoring Albert Einstein's vision that quantum mechanics has limitations. In, uh, in the spring 1978, <clears throat> I wrote this paper uh, that was released as a preprint 
uh, with my affiliation to the, um, the Harvard Department of Mathematics, in which, as you can see, I put Einstein names in the title. So, um, this paper was subsequently published by the Foundation of Physics in 1981. Now, in, um, back, to, uh, uh, back to the spring 1978, I, I made hundreds of copies of the preprint at that time, and I personally put them in the, in the mailboxes of my colleagues at Harvard and my colleagues at MIT with, um, uh, with, with a kind, uh, respectful letter indicating essentially the need for, to, uh, to consider Einstein vision um, as an, uh, uh, because most very promising, if not necessary, for, uh, for the prediction and quantitative treatment of new form of energy, both physical and chemical. Unfortunately, this rather vast action uh, achieved no result, no interest whatsoever I can possibly remember. I continue to, um, uh, to, to, to make sure the colleagues knew that I was not pursuing my personal dreams, but I was uh, honoring Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. I kept um, occasionally putting the, the, their names in the title or the word uh, completion. For instance, this paper published in, uh, also in Foundation of Physics in 1997, you can see from the title, Relativistic Hadronic Mechanics, Axiom Preserving, I don't change the axiom, Axiom Preserving Completion of Relativistic Quantum Mechanics. Despite uh, this effort, th there was no, um, no interest uh, from the, the mainstream, uh, 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 mainstream academia, with the exception of a growing number of luminaries who indeed recognize, not my view, but recognize the power of Einstein vision. And they did write indeed, they did make absolutely seminal contribution that um, they will properly review during this conference. The number of applications of the Lee admissible and Jordan admissible branch of Badroni mechanics, also known as uh, Geno mechanics, are just too many to be outlined in this lecture. Let me briefly men mention that the achievement of, um, of, a, of a mechanics with an irreversible structure trigger a number of very interesting papers by uh, various authors in various countries, studying apparently for the first time the connection between mechanics and thermodynamics, of course, through the intermediary step of statistical mechanics, for instance, along the non-unitary statistical mechanics by the Nobel laureate Ilya Prigogine, whose friendship really honored me. Um, on the chemical grounds, we developed a new fuel called manya gas that, admit, that admits full combustion, no measurable CO or hydrocarbons in the exhaust. And the public company was um, organized, known as manya gas Corporation, now called the Taronis Corporation, where that is still treated, treated at the NASDAQ. A second public company corporation, the Thunder Energy Corporation, now known as Adronic Technology Corporation, is studying basically new out-of-the-box nuclear fusion along um, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen argument. That is rather promising indeed because basically new. For a number of additional application, experimental verification and, uh, and epistemological treatment, I recommend the interested author to consult my three volumes of Elements of Adronic Mechanics. I would like now to outline the second problem in physics and chemistry that requires an apparently necessary completion of quantum mechanics in order to achieve a quantitative treatment of the problem considered. This problem deals with the ultimate limitation of quantum mechanics, namely its approximation of particles as being point-like while moving in empty space. Such an approximation has been proven to be fantastic, excellent, fully satisfactory for the atomic structure, particles in accelerator, and many other systems. However, I cannot upset the idea that the same approximation applies to whatever additional conditions may exist in the universe, because we know that hadrons, nuclei, and star are hyperdense structures that are composed by extended wave packet and or ex um, extended charge distributions in condition of mutual penetrations. 
to review the studies underlying the second problem that lasted for about half a century, let me go back to spring 1974 when I joined um, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I had a three years magnificent stay there. I was honored by very distinguished colleagues. Uh, I'm very still grateful for their hospitality. And uh, however, I, I was uneasy during, uh, during that stay. The reason because I was in the temple of authority of quantum mechanics, while in reality I was there to complete quantum mechanics according to Einstein's legacy. The reason for my uneasiness is that I never accepted quantum mechanics as being the final theory for nuclear structure since at the time of my graduate studies at the University of Torino, because quantum mechanics has been unable to achieve an exact representation of the experimental data, which is the deuteron, with um, uh, embarrassing deviation from the prediction of the theory from experimental data for heavier nuclei such as the zirconium. Here is an illustration of, um, of this uh, very important aspect. As we all know, representation of the uh, uh, magnetic moment of the deuteron, despite all conceivably possible corrections, uh, including quarks and uh, quantum field theory and many other attempts, there still remain a 1% unresolved representation. Next, uh, there is a mystery in, in nuclear physics that has baffled me and a number of other colleagues, namely, the neutron we all know is unstable in nature, yet when it is combined with the proton, it becomes permanently stable. Well, it is my view that until we understand this mechanism, which is not even addressed by quantum mechanics, our knowledge of nuclear structure will be limited. But it was baffled by the representation, by the spin one of the deuteron. According to the basic axioms of quantum mechanics, Particles with spin one half, such as proton and neutron, can only couple in a stable way in singlet, resulting in zero total angular momentum, while the deuteron has spin one. Well, in order to maintain quantum mechanics, then the nuclear physicists consider a collection of, of, of states, the ground state, as well as excited states, and in this way, they do indeed achieve um, angular momentum one. But to be faced, we have to admit reality. A deuteron, when it's isolated in vacuum, it is in the ground state with spin one. That is the physical reality we have to address. I completed my stay at MIT by writing a number of papers on the integrability conditions for the existence of Lagrangian and Hamiltonian, published under my affiliation at MIT, as well as preparing the draft of two volumes of foundations of theoretical mechanics that were released at MIT preprint. Actually, I would like to add that um, my work on the completion of, of quantum mechanics was still an extremely immature in 1974. And I simply did not have the courage to address such distinguished colleagues and tell them what at that time were essentially my personal dream. And uh, so in September 1977, I left MIT to join uh, Harvard University under a grant from the Department of Energy. A few days following my arrival at, at Harvard, I was called by the, uh, the DOE with the request that I should try to investigate some basically new out-of-the-box possibility of achieving in the future the controlled nuclear fusion. I told the officer that that is a magnificent task. Definitely, yes, I am interested, but at one condition, however, that I had first to understand the most fundamental fusion in nature, which is essentially the fusion of the hydrogen atom into the neutron in the core of star. As soon as I initiated to study this problem, I immediately recognized that the synthesis of the neutron from the hydrogen atom simply cannot be quantitatively described by quantum mechanics for a variety of technical reasons. The most important one being that the mass of the neutron is bigger than the sum of the mass of the proton and the electron, as a result of which, in the event uh, you, you want to use a Schrodinger equation, you have to use a positive um, potential energy, and you have to come up with mass excess. Those aspects are simply anathema 
for, for quantum mechanics. So this aspect essentially sealed in my mind the absolute necessity of following Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen teaching that, um, uh, that there exist indeed conditions in the universe for which quantum mechanics is, has to be completed. These results were published in this Harvard paper, Carries my affiliation at the Lyman Laboratory of Physics of 1978. The moment I decided to complete quantum mechanics, I immediately went back to the founders of our knowledge, as I usually do, I rarely study their followers, because only by studying the originator you see their intuition and their view. And in fact, I immediately discovered from Enrico Fermi that he believed, quote, that the usual co concept of geometry not necessarily apply in the interior of strongly interacting particle, end of quote. This means that the structure of generalization is, is needed in Fermi's view for the structure of the hadrons, and Mason, and Baryons. Also then I went to Blatt and Weisskopf, who wrote justly celebrated excellent book in nuclear physics, and they stayed very clear it is possible that the intrinsic magnetic moment of a nucleon, when in close proximity with another nucleon, is different than the corresponding value in vacuum. Thus, this historical account sets clearly the target, namely to achieve an invariant representation of extended particles under condition of mutual entanglement, penetration with other, with therefore ensuing most general conceivable interaction, which are generally called of nonlinear, non-local, and non-Hamiltonian character, according to the conception of the nucleus depicted in this figure, which is according to experimental data. Indeed, if you compare the volume of nucleons with respect to the nuclear volume, you will see the nuclear are partially in a condition of neutral penetration. By contrast, quantum mechanics will only allow me the conception of a nuclear here on the left, namely an ideal sphere with the isolated point in it. I, there is no question I, I recognize the historical value the, of quantum mechanics as an approximate description of nuclei. After all, nuclear power plants, uh, they do work. So we have to admit the historical character, but this is not the point in this lecture. This lecture is to look at the future so that so the human knowledge can advance. Once the problem uh, was identified, I immediately went through all the libraries of the Cantabrian area, including, of course, Harvard and MIT and Brandeis. I also consulted a number of mathematical luminaries in the area that were indeed there are great mathematicians in the area. And the way I asked them the question, I need um, to represent um, the proton and neutron as extended, therefore deformable. What kind of mathematics can I, um, can I use? And therefore, had to be built. So I went to work. And I was moved from the Lima Laboratory of Physics to the Department of Mathematics at Harvard University. The first thing I did was to generalize Einstein's uh, language, which was a complete a conventional associative product of a two arbitrary quantity, matrix, function, number, etc., into this form here, which is axiom preserved, namely the product to the right is still associative, but nevertheless is broader because it contains an, an, a matrix, an operator T called the isotopic element, which has an arbitrary functional dependence and is only restricted by the condition of being bigger than zero. Following the introduction of this um, associative preserving process, also called it isoproduct, it was immediately possible to introduce a representation of the nuclear structure that I was looking for, namely as a collection of extended, generally non-spherical and deformable proton as represented by the, this uh, space term, the fourth term being re representing the density, plus an exponential part which represents all, all expected non-linear, non-local, and non-potential interaction. And this is exactly what I was looking for. Um, but I immediately realized that by generalizing the product, ladies and gentlemen, that I had to generalize the totality of applied mathematics that I've been studying all my life. The first was a mandatory generalization of Lie algebra, which I did immediately following the introduction of the ISO product. I did it in the second volume of foundational theoretical mechanics, where you can find an isotopic lifting or completion, if you want, 
of all aspects of the Lie algebra, including enveloping algebra, Lie algebra, Lie group, transformation theory, etc. After that, a number of distinguished mathematicians that work in the, in the field, and uh, should part in particular mention um, uh, Professor Gregorio Zagas of the University of Thessaloniki in Greece, who wrote a, a book entitled Santilli Lie Isotopic Algebras. And then I discovered that this was not enough because the unit of a numeric field used throughout the 20th century, which is the number one, um, is not conserved by the time evolution of this theory because it is non-unitary. Therefore, this theory, to, to achieve consistency, this theory requires new number. It had to be formulated in new number and cannot be formulated on over conventional number. After spending years of trial and error, finally I had the courage of asking the question whether the abstract axiom of a numeric field do indeed admit some new realization or not. Once I had that courage, the answer was yes. And indeed, it came out that the axiom of a numeric field do not necessarily require that the basic multiplicative unit is the number one. No, it can be an arbitrary quantity, provided that it is positive, definitely. In this way, I introduced the so-called ISO numbers which are depicted here, that also stimulate a number of mathematical work, including a monograph by the Chinese mathematician uh, Yang, um, entitled Santilli Isonumber Theory. So this new mathematics that became known as isomathematics started to have some momentum, but I still um, was missing the fundamental issue, namely the capability of maintaining over time the deformed character of the extended proton and neutron. So I spent years looking everywhere for any possible insufficiency uh, with no result. Finally, I had the courage of ad addressing the real limitation of quantum mechanics, which is given by Newton differential calculus. Why so? Because Newton differential calculus can only be defined to a finite number of, of isolated points and with ensuing necessary condition of representing particles as, as point light. Some of my colleagues uh, disagree with me, said no, New Newton differential calculus belongs to Newtonian mechanics. I respect their view, but I, uh, but I disagree, because look at the Schrodinger equation, Heisenberg equation. They are defined by the Newton differential calculus. So un until that the differentials and the derivative appearing in those equations are broadened, from there the current, uh, the, the old definition at only at isolated point, to definition in volume covered by the particle, then uh, quantum mechanics cannot be consistently completed. This is, was my view at the time, it is my view now. Finally, in 1995, I had the second courage of addressing Newton differential calculus, asking the question whether uh, the axiom of this calculus admits some, some kind of degree of freedom. And the answer was yes. And um, the abstract axiom of uh, Newton differential cal calculus do not require that the multiplicative unit has to be the trivial number one, but can be an arbitrary positive definite quantity, which can also depend on the local variable of differentiation. This was the birth of the isodifferential calculus, which is at the ultimate foundation, because the representation of extended particles within physical media starts here. I published the isodifferential calculus in 1996 at uh, Rendi Conti Circolo Mathematico Palermo, I remember that my wife and uh, I um, made a, a, a trip, Tampa, Palermo, Palermo, Tampa, for one specific reason, to say thank you to the editor, Professor Vitro, for publishing what appears to be my most important paper, the paper on the generalization of differential calcul calculus from its definition to point, to its definition to volume, representing extended particles. Many years later, the mathematician finally discovered this new calculus, and there has been a flurry of, um, of activity. I have to mention here uh, Professor Svetlin Georgia, who has written not one, two, three, no, has written five volume in the is a differential calculus, which are published and are available from Nova Academic uh, Publishers. Following the achievement of maturity, and only following the achievement of maturity, the corresponding formulation of completion of quantum mechanics into the, the, the Lie isotopic uh, branch of hadronic uh, mechanics, also called 
isomechanics was essentially elementary. And that's uh, basically you replace every product, conventional product with an isoproduct and you get the new mechanics. And the new mechanics can be obtained by um, non-unitary transformation of, the, of quantum mechanics. So it's very simple to construct um, against uh, the rather widespread belief that Santil is doing uh, complex mathematics. No, all our physical models can be constructed by a method known to a first year graduate student namely because you have mainly have to use non-unitary transform of, uh, of established quantum mechanical procedures. There is one point, however, that has quite uh, some deep uh, connection and implication, and it is uh, given by the, the realization of the linear momentum, which is compatible with the rest of the, uh, the formulation in isomechanics. The, until uh, to understand the, 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 this implication, uh, colleagues should know that by 1994, we still did not have and the completion of quantum mechanics that was sufficiently mature for application and experimental verification. Why so? Because we missed a, a consistent realization of the linear momentum. And uh, lacking the linear momentum, I, I didn't know how to construct the angular momentum. I, I was frozen. <laughs> and why, but, um, why, the, why the difficulty? Well, because it turned out that the reason for the inconsistency is because uh, all realization in isomechanics of the linear momentum via the use of Newton differential calc turn out to be inconsistent. So the, um, so the realization of the, of the linear uh, momentum in, uh, in, uh, in, in, adro in adronic mechanics is the most uh, compelling evidence on the need to generalize Newton differential calculus under which the transition from points to particle to extended particle may eventually result to be a dream, but not a scientific reality. Most importantly, I would recommend to note the, the, the commutation of ISO commutation of coordinates in ISO space, but the coordinates do not commute in, when projected in conventional space, thus illustrating the deep nonlinearity of the theory, even to linear at the, ISO, at the higher level of ISO spaces over ISO field. Following the achievement of maturity and in isomathematics first and then in um, isomechanics, there were a flurry of, uh, of application, experimental verification, industrial applications. But I plunged myself in, uh, in, uh, in what was my original aim uh, back in, in the mid 1960 during my graduate studies at the University of Torino, namely prove that the Einstein vision on the lack of completion of quantum mechanics was indeed plausible and uh, significant for advancement of human knowledge. And therefore, I went immediately to, um, to use the, the formalism to pr the, for the first proof of the EPR argument. At that time, I was a guest of the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in, in Dubna, uh, Russia. Thanks to such a gracious hospitality, in 1994, I wrote uh, uh, in Dubna, the, the, this paper that was submitted to Acta Applicanda Mathematica in 1994, eventually published in 1998, following four years of grueling, grueling, <laughs> grueling referee review, but eventually it was published. What does this paper say? Well, this paper first shows that the ISO product permits an instantaneous concrete and explicit realization of hidden variables via this determinant for the case of spin one half, two dimension, for the case of which is realized for the form which is realized here. And this realization of um, the hidden variable persists even when you assume that the determinant of the isotopic element is one. So once um, <laughs> the hidden variable were, were no longer hidden, but were realized explicitly, in a concrete matrix way, everything was, uh, was consequential. You do the map of the um, uh, poly matrices, they're called the poly Santilli isomatrix. Since the transformation is non unitary, you can be sure that, um, that uh, the, the, the structural constant and the eigenvalue are the same. Yet you recompute Bell's expression and you clearly see that there's a large multiple that the new expression, the hadronic expression, is uh, thanks to the, this hidden variable, is a large multiple of Bell's inequality. So therefore, a system of extended particles within um, uh, in condition of deep mutual penetration or entanglement does indeed admit, according to this theory, 
have a classical counterpart, but therefore proving Einstein's first legacy. Following the publication of the, the paper at Acta Applicando Mathematicas, I somewhat abandoned my old uh, aim of proving um, Einstein's legacy because of co virtually complete lack of uh, interest by the scientific community, except, as I indicated earlier, a few luminaries that indeed can change the history of science. And they pushed me that, uh, Ruggiero, you've got to complete your task. So I went back to work years later, and in, um, and in, uh, in December 2019, I published at uh, um, uh, Ratio Mathematica this paper that essentially proves the, perhaps the most important part of Einstein's legacy, namely the possibility of Einstein determinism. Let's review this very, very quickly. Those are the uncertainty of quantum mechanics, extremely well known. You, re you recompute everything under isotopy, it's a rather elementary calculation, and you see the, that the standard deviations in, in isomechanics are uh, proportional to the, uh, to the absolute value of the isotopic element T. But the isotopic element T um, is uh, extremely small for any, 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 any interior system of extended particle in condition of, of mutual penetration, and in particular that um, this uh, isotopic element that tends to the value of the isotopic element tends to zero under gravitational collapse. So in this way, it's both the product of the um, uh, standard deviation, as well as them individually, they will tend to zero with the decrease of the value of the isotopic element. So to prove Einstein's um, uh, um, intuition, I basically recall Schwarzschild metric. I decompose Schwarzschild metric into the product of, uh, of the isotopic element multiplied by a convention of Minkowski metric. I assume identically the, um, for the isotopic element, the space part, we are doing only a space theory here. So I assume the space part of the isotopic element. And then it, it was elementary to show that the limit of the standard product of the standard deviation within the gravitational collapse tend to zero by therefore recovering Einstein determinism. The number of applications of isomathematic are just too many to be, to be listed here. It includes uh, theoretical, mathematical, and, and scientific, as well as industrial, a number of industrial applications. I just want to mention that, that uh, the, I mentioned that we, um, we, uh, we, I, I did achieve an exact representation of all characteristics of the neutron in, the, um, in, in its synthesis from the hydrogen atom, both at the non-relativistic and the, at the relativistic level, the, but, but only thanks to the, the completion of quantum mechanics into hadronic mechanics. One point of curiosity, so to say, but also significant, uh, colleagues should, should know that uh, the, the, I can only publish the, 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 the results in Russia at the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research, thus illustrating my appreciation to Russian colleagues. And uh, this was the, done via um, uh, uh, the Joint Institute, released a, a communication on my results. But the results were then published in China, but it was impossible to publish this, these results in the United States of America, England, or Italy. I um, uh, noticed that each of those papers achieved a, a numerically exact representation of, of, of um, nuclear magnetic moment for the first time in history. Despite that, papers were rejected. This has a very significant number of uh, applications, uh, development, above all, experimental verifications of the formalism in, uh, in various uh, branches, uh, such as, for instance, in, uh, for the, um, the behavior of the mean life of unstable particle with speed, Bose-Einstein correlation. I would recommend the interested author to consult my three volumes of element of hadronic mechanics. I would like now to outline the third problem in mathematics and physics that requires an apparent mandatory completion of quantum mechanics in order to achieve a quantitative treatment of the problem considered. This third problem deals with the ultimate and most fundamental problem of chemistry, which is molecular structure. With the clear repeated admission and recollection that quantum chemistry has indeed achieved absolutely historical advances in, the, in human knowledge throughout uh, the past, since uh, its inception. 
Allow me to admit that I, I never considered quantum chemistry to be the final theory for chemistry. But the reason was, and it is now, that quantum chemistry still misses a quantitative re model representing the valence bond in a way consistent with experimental evidence. In fact, if you, con if you consult the most advanced uh, um, available uh, treatises in, in quantum chemistry, you will see here uh, that, the, for instance, the water molecule is represented like this with the little legs, you know, joining uh, hydrogen and, uh, and, uh, and oxygen. And, um, but essentially, the bond between the hydrogen and hydrogen is a nomenclature because it misses the attractive force, because it misses an equation representing the bond between the valence electron of the hydrogen and the corresponding valence electron of the oxygen. The reason for my reservation regarding the lack of final character of quantum chemistry, and therefore the needs for its completion, goes back to my gra graduate studies. Because it's very easy to see that the Schrodinger equation for the two valence electron of a molecular bond the, those electrons, they repel each other. You need a positive potential energy here because the electrons have the same charge. Then you do a little calculation and you can easily see that the two electrons are repelled them with a force of the order of 230 newtons. This is an astronomically big repulsive force. I cannot have peace in my mind until at least I try to, to solve this problem. And indeed, it was only thanks to the investment by the financial community that invested significant funds in, in Manya Gas Corporation. Then I had all the means to study this problem in the early and mid-2000. Uh, and it was a relatively, at that time, it was a relatively possible, I don't want to use the word easy, it was possible to show that indeed the completion of this uh, uh, basic equation into, the, um, into the, the corresponding equation of hadronic mechanics or iso isomechanics, which is essentially required and the mission of here, uh, in this product of the isotopic element and the use of um, uh, the isodifferential calculus, and then this lifting of this completion does indeed allow the achievement for the first time in, in my knowledge of an attractive, not only an attractive force between the two electrons, but a strongly attractive force represented by the Alton uh, potential. I should stress that my no mean the electrons in the valence bond are identical to the electron in vacuum, ladies and gentlemen. This uh, conception is outside physical and chemical reality. It turned out that the electron in valence bond, they are extremely intermangled in a very complex way with non-linear, non-local, and non-Hamiltonian uh, non interaction. So, so an attractive force is indeed po possible because of the mutation completion, if you want, of their structure, resulting in a problem that perhaps is one of the most interesting problems that I have addressed in my life. I published the results in, um, in this volume, a foundation of, of hadronic chemistry, published in 2001. And then, um, thanks to the collaboration by Don Schillady, a chemist of Virginia, Commonwealth University. Most collaboration, I still honor me and I still have no words to express my appreciation. With his collaboration, we proved that this new strong valence bond um, allows apparently for the first time the achievement of um, an ex numerical exact to the desired decimal representation of the characteristic of the hydrogen molecule in this paper and the, uh, and the water molecule in this uh, second uh, paper. In my paper published in December 2019, Ratio Mathematica, I have shown the possibility of Einstein determinism for extended, therefore, the formable particles in the interior of gravitational collapse. We should also recall that the majority of the scientific community nowadays accepts the lack of validity of quantum mechanics in the interior of a black, black hole due to the extreme density exists locally in such areas. Despite all that, the data elaboration of the totality of high energy scattering experiment conducted at CERN, Fermilab, and other um, particle physics laboratory around the world 
said data elaboration is done by the use of quantum mechanics, despite the fact that the scattering region achieved nowadays a density comparable to that in the interior of a black hole. This occurrence established the societal, let alone the scientific need of due scientific process on Einstein's important view that quantum mechanics is not a complete theory, namely is not a theory <clears throat> that can describe the entirety of all possible conditions existing throughout the universe. Additionally, in three quarters of a century, we've been unable to achieve the controlled nuclear fusion in, uh, despite the investment of billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. In this lecture, we have shown that quantum mechanics is not expected to be exactly valid for nuclear fusion because of, of its strictly irreversible character, while quantum mechanics is strictly reversible over time. Moreover, we have shown that the addition of contribution from irreversibility implies rather major engineering implementation. This is a second case illustrating the importance of due scientific process on Einstein's view that quantum mechanics is not a complete theory. Finally, during the past century, quantum chemistry has been unable to achieve a clean combustion of fossil fuel with the ensuing environmental problems that are now affecting the entirety of the human society. <clears throat> In this lecture, we have shown that a reason for this insufficiency is the lack in quantum chemistry of a quantitative representation of molecular structures because the two identical electrons of a valence bond are expected to repel each other. According to the Coulomb law, we have studied since high school. In this lecture, we also shown that quantum chemistry cannot possibly provide a consistent representation of energy releasing chemical reactions because the latter are irreversible over time, while quantum chemistry is strictly reversible over time since it is based on quantum action. In this lecture, we have also shown that, um, that uh, by using a suitable completion of quantum chemistry, there is a realistic possibility of achieving indeed an attractive force between an identical valence electron under their suitable entanglement as well as to achieve a, a, a consistent representation of energy releasing, therefore irreversible chemical reactions. This is a third clear example <clears throat> of, the, of the societal, let alone the scientific value that after about one century of oblivion, the scientific community finally implements due scientific process as well as scientific democracy on Einstein's important legacy that quantum mechanics is not a complete theory. In conclusion, I believe that the scientific community is facing the following alternative. On one side, the continued sole use of quantum mechanics uh, for whatever a condition exists throughout the universe in, in complete oblivion of Einstein's legacy may eventually imply a scientific obscurantism of historical proportion. By contrast, the proper implementation of due scientific process and serious scientific democracy on Einstein's legacy may well allow mankind to reach the stars within a few generations. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat>